Hello and welcome back to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I am here with Rebecca Johnson, the executive director of Todd Martin Youth Leadership. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me. You're, you're so welcome. And how we really start this show is telling us about the mission of your organization, because the title of the show is Mission Control. So you tell me what mission you control. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so Todd Martin Youth Leadership exists um, to prepare young people, especially those from under-resourced families and communities for success as individuals and as active, responsible citizens through innovative tennis, education, life skills, mentoring, and leadership development. Great. Wow. That was just like, boom. How many times did you have to say that within the last (laughs) few months? It takes some time to practice. (laughs) That's great. So um, just let's take it from the top. How did you end up in this role? I I think I saw somewhere that you've worked with Todd Martin for quite a while. Yeah, so I've been in this role for a little over five years, um, but I've I'm from the Lansing area. I grew up, you know, knowing Todd. Grew up playing tennis at the club where where he trained and played. Um, so I've no always known about him um, and known about the organization, um, kind of from a tennis family um and so have have lived that life and know the opportunities and the access that tennis can provide as a sport um for youth and and my background is in special education and social work and so this role really brings all of my love for working with youth and working with um under-resourced youth specifically through sport um, and meshes it all together. So that is incredible. I mean, what are the chances that you're going to find and work with kids around tennis, but not necessarily being a tennis pro? Yeah. I mean, is there, it seems like a unique way of, uh, of doing things. Is, is there, any other organizations similar to this that you know that you can actually you know like model yeah so it's interesting so we are part of a larger network so the unit i'm going to throw a bunch of acronyms at you oh, so boy. You-, <laughs> you know it's a nonprofit podcast win Right, exactly. <laughs> so the United States Tennis Association, the USTA Um, The foundation arm um, has a whole network of what they call national junior and tennis, tennis and learning chapters. So NJTL. So they're actually almost 300 around the country. So we are one of those. Um, and, And the basic premise is that you use tennis, you integrate education and some sort of life skills and leadership development. But there's no structure as far as what that looks like. So that allows you to look at your community, see the need in your community, um, choose the ages of the youth you're going to serve, how you're going to serve them, what you're going to do, the dosage. Um, And really, it's just part of this larger network. We're all independent nonprofits, um, but there is kind of that level of support and model. Um, And the NJTL network was actually started and was a brainchild of Arthur Ashe. Wow. Wow. That's, that's quite the pedigree. Yes. So, um, So you mentioned that you knew Todd Martin from before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Did you say he was a family friend? Is that what? Yeah, he's become a family friend. He he grew up, or I grew up playing at the club where where he played as well. Um, so he'd come back for fundraisers. I have a great picture of him. 
I don't know, I was probably eight. Um, so I love, love to bring that up, um, you know. What is it, so tell me, what is it like to work with Todd Martin, the, the, the namesake of the organization? Yeah. Yeah, it's great because really um, he's such a great guy. He's fully dedicated to just giving opportunity and access to kids who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. And really, it, he wants it to be community based. He doesn't want it to be about him. He doesn't want to be about his name. Um, it's just about really the Lansing community providing these opportunities, um, but kind of using his, his fame and, and his following to move that forward. And so what, so what does he, I mean, obviously as the executive director, you're mm -hmm. doing the day-to-day, -day, all this yeah. stuff. I mean, other than his name, is there anything that he's looked on to provide yeah, so he's a huge support to us um, with our fundraising events. So we do an annual event in Chicago and then an annual event in Lansing, and, and he attends both of those. And, um, you know, we spread him pretty thin between different events and meetings and lunches. And, um, and so he, you know, fully dedicates that time to us those few weekends. Um, but he's always you know, a confidant or, you know, he's, he's open to feedback, but, but really wants, wants it to be about the community. Um, and kind of, kind of lets myself and our staff and the board run the show and, and he'll step in as, as we ask. Hmm. And so coming back to you, yeah, you've been in your role, like you said, about six years. Yeah. Success. True. Mm -hmm. How have you dove into the executive director role to make it your own? What have what are the things that you brought to the table to obviously um, Todd likes what you're doing? Yeah. Because uh, you know, you're still here, you're still doing doing the stuff that you like to do, but what have you done to really, you know, create this as your own as well? Yeah, it's super interesting. Like I said, my background is in special ed and in school social work. And so I'm used to, you know, kind of having my own like microcosm, for lack of a better word, within an organization. And so that was definitely different for me to come into more of a leadership role. Um, but it's really allowed me to use my strengths in like building community partners and working with others. Um and really just leveraging the assets that we all have to help do better for youth. So working with other youth development organizations in the city of Lansing to do what we all do and to do it better. Um, working really closely with the Lansing School District and providing support there um, in some areas where they're lacking or don't have support. Because um, really you know, we're all in this together, like we're all part of the same fabric. And so I don't see any of that as like competition with other nonprofits or you serving organizations. It's all of like, hey, what do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? Cool, let's bring it together and better serve our kids. And so how do you talk to the kids about the fact that um, tennis is one facet? Yeah. Of what we do. Uh, how do you have this conversation with them and the parents? Yeah. So we have a variety of different programs. And so the level of tennis and the intensity is different depending on those different programs. We do a lot in the schools during the day. We do after school programs. We do Friday night programs, summer programs. Um, so there's this wide range of interaction, but we always have a focus on like a, a leadership theme and a social emotional theme. And we use tennis as a vehicle to address those and really like impress the importance of, you know, healthy activity and leadership and teamwork and tennis as a vehicle um, to provide you with those skills to be successful later in life. Um, and so really 
you know, if we can produce another Todd Martin, sweet, but that's not our goal, right? It's all about um, the life skills and the assets that the kids develop as a result of playing sports. And, you know, there's so much research behind the efficacy of sport um, and helping kids to be more successful later in life. Um, and so really just pushing those um, ideas and, and doing the same with the parents too. One of the things that I've noticed, um, with what you do and, and who you have as part of the organization is kind of almost like stepping stones. Mm -hmm. It's like you have the ability to bring up, uh, youth that, may have gone through your program to become more of a day-to-day -day, uh, person doing mentoring and such. So talk a little bit about how you've had the success with the generational leadership that you've mm -hmm. developed um, in your programs. Yeah. And that's a huge part of what we do. I mean, the, the, the most important thing we do is build relationships. So whether that's with kids, parents, schools, um, and especially with our participants and providing those opportunities to um, volunteer with our programs. And for some of our kids, it's a requirement to volunteer X number of hours and then providing junior coach opportunities. So we'll hire kids starting at 16 and then hire them on at 18. And really to us, you know, those are the kids who have like walked the walk. And so they're the best ones to continue to the next generation. And so, you know, we have a junior advisory board. And so all of our members there are volunteering with our programs and learning the ins and outs. And um, yeah, most of our staff has gone through our program and, and want to give back. And to me, that shows the impact of what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, from what I've heard from a lot of our staff and volunteers too, is like, they, they want to be there. They want to give back because it has given them so much. Um, so it's really cool to see that, that full circle. And it's also fun because, you know, some of those staff that, you know, were a bit challenging back in their day, it's really <laughs> ironic when they get some challenging kids to deal with. And it's like, yeah. This was you about 10 years ago. So. Oh, karma. Oh, karma. It's a crazy exactly. thing. Well, now you mentioned that you, you do, do you have programming in Chicago as well, seeing as you do a fundraiser there? We don't. So we don't okay. do any programming there. Um, Todd, started out at Northwestern and he played there for two years. So he has kind of a cohort and a following there. And then we do have a lot of um, Lansing natives that are based in Chicago now that support us. And, and so it just made sense um, to do some fundraising there, but we are looking at, you know, what that looks like long-term. Right on. And so talk to me about um, tennis and then it's a, in it of itself mm -hmm. over the last few years i mean has there been any um has it has the interest ever waned or has it ever waned due to gender because you know if you think about um uh like the mid aughts to the 2010s you mm -hmm. would see more professional women players Mm -hmm. American women players mm -hmm. than you would um, men American players, right. unlike the 90s into the beginning of the 2000s. I right. mean, has there so have you have you battled any of that type of waning interest or or is it or you just pivot a different way? Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen that from what we're experiencing. And honestly, tennis as a whole, as an industry, saw a huge influx during COVID because it was one of the few safer sports. Um, and so racket sales and all of that stuff has has really boomed since COVID. Um, 
and and so for us it's all about how we position that with our with our kids and with our parents and getting them involved um and so we haven't we haven't seen um we haven't seen any waning interest i think for us there's sometimes this um like idea that we're competing against football or basketball or some of those more popular sports. But I think there's so much of a compliment with those sports because tennis involves so much um, like lateral movement and fitness. And so trying to figure out how we can fit into and just accommodate kids that are in those other sports. But really for us, it's just getting kids moving and through COVID and kids being in school virtually. And then prior to that, having um, a lack of PE in the schools, that's the biggest hurdle we're seeing is kids just being reticent to being active. Um, and so that that's our biggest hurdle. With, uh, with the fact that you um, target an underserved population, Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, or that's the um, audience that you work with. Is there any hindrances to, uh, uh, like, equipment or mm -hmm. places to play? Is there stuff, do you run into obstacles in that regard? Yeah, for sure. And that's something that we really work to break down that barrier. So we'll provide equipment, whether that's, balls, shoes, rackets, whatever that is. Um, but the space to play is an ongoing issue. Um, and so that's something we're working really closely with the city of Lansing. Um, like our current location is at Let's. We have four outdoor courts there, but they're not in great shape. So what does that look like, you know, in the next few years to potentially demo those and rebuild six courts? Um, and so having that space to play is is an ongoing issue. And it's not just unique to us. Um, I think, you know, the other, given that we're in Michigan, the other issue that we have is access to indoor space. And so we can utilize gyms. Um, and actually, we've worked with the city of Lansing to um, renovate the gym at Let's Community Center to more of a tennis court material. Um, so that's been huge for us, but it doesn't accommodate a full court. So we can do stuff with our like 10 and under kids in there. Um, but really the city of Lansing doesn't have dedicated indoor courts. Like MSU Tennis Center is technically in Lansing, but both varsity teams use that. And Court One North has a few courts, but it's used by their members. And so Access, public access to quality indoor courts is lacking. So that's definitely something that's on our radar um, and that we we feel is necessary for us to advocate for and, and potentially build. And so um, looking at your your education hat yeah. that you wear, Along, alongside all the others. <laughs> One of the, it'd be, I'd be remiss not to mention this because it's probably, these are probably conversations that you've had with your students or even the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, especially hitting close to home, is the increase um, in school shootings and inappropriate uh, conversations around those i mean is yeah. this something that you've come across is it something that um uh, that is part of your programming to make sure that you know this isn't something you just like kick to the side <clears throat> yeah so my biggest message to our staff and our volunteers is we meet kids where they are and so this is where they are. This is what they're experiencing. And so um, the onus is on us to engage in those conversations. So a lot of how we approach it is just like sitting with them and their feelings and hearing what the, how they're experiencing it, what they're going through, um, and really just trying to help help them 
process um, and, and figure out what this means. And I'm a mom of two young kids and, you know, it hits different, right, as a parent too. And, and helping parents to process that. Um, a lot of our volunteers and staff are MSU students and what happened last week was jarring, you know, for the whole community, but for those especially that were in close proximity and giving them this space to process and, you know, as they feel comfortable to share those feelings with the kids they're working with, like knowing that we're all in this together and we're a community, um, but, but also creating safe space, um, like physical space, right? So making sure that we're safe and, you know, we know what active shooter drills are at our community center and all of that, you know? So I think it's the emotional safety. I think it's the physical safety and just opening those doors to the conversations. Now you, you, you've mentioned let's a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and so that that's actually a fairly new addition to the organization. Yeah. Yep. In having a home, a yep. home home. How does that feel? Yeah, it's it's great. And you know, we're still um we're still in schools and we're still in other parks, but it just feels good to have a home and to have a place that, you know, we share with the city of Lansing and the other programs that they have there. Um and just to really, for us, it's for our kids to feel like they have a home, right? Like, I'm going to go here and I'm going to be with TMYL. Um, and so that's that's been good. And, and we're looking forward to further developing and in, making improvements to really make it a hub for tennis and education um, for the city. I think that's awesome. I think that I like the fact that you're like right in the heart in accessible. Yeah. And so over the past six years, what are some uh, key lessons that you've learned being, being the, the leader? Man, I've learned so much. I feel like the more I learn, the less I know. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, one is just, the Lansing community is just so unique and so incredible. Um, and just seeing so many people that want to do good and want to serve our communities. Um, and I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is like, we're better together um, and just having conversations and having open dialogue about where we need help or where we can provide help to others. Um, is huge. I think, I think the other important thing, and this isn't necessarily new, but is just our kids have a lot of the answers. Our parents have a lot of the answers. Um, and so just listening to them um, and, you know, not having this kind of top down mentality in the programming we're providing, but really um, putting everybody um, at the same level and, and really valuing everyone's input is huge. And so with that, where do you find, um, what, or excuse me, let me rephrase that. What is your, the organization, what do you feel is the biggest strength of Todd Martin youth leadership? I think our biggest strength is our personnel. Um, I think the people we have on staff, the volunteers are all in um, and really willing to go the distance to do what is needed to support the community and pivoting as those needs change. And uh, what, so what do you see? I mean, you've seen, I mean, you've overseen like um, development of programming, development of these youth leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know, moving your office into a new space, mm -hmm. getting that going. What is the next big thing you want to tackle? 
Yeah. So I think, you know, the next big thing for us is really working with the city to figure out development at let. So like I mentioned before, the demo of the current outdoor courts, building new outdoor courts, figuring out what indoor courts could look like um, and other updates to the building to really just be a one-stop shop um, and provide that access to play that's missing right now. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, those are huge because like you said, the access to environments that you can control mm-hmm. is, is such a, such a key, key aspect. Yeah, exactly. So, um, what are some things that you would like to work on for you? Like, uh, to have you get better? I mean, because it's a, it's an ever evolving role. Yeah. So what are things that you're looking at? Like, you know, uh, I want to tackle this more for myself or to, so that I can lead better here. Yeah. Yeah. I think ongoing professional development is, is huge. Um, and for me, given my background, I, I know a lot of the programming side. I know a lot of the education side, but I'm like learning the fundraising as I go. So I think just more professional development around fundraising and especially as we, you know, potentially engage in a capital campaign um, with the improvements I mentioned, um, that'll be a huge part of that. I think for me too, you know, it's just managing a team and developing developing a staff. Um, you know, like I said before, I've kind of been on my own as a school social worker and a special educator. And so really learning how to help develop my staff and support them um, is ongoing for me as well. With all this that you have going on and the fact that you have two little ones. Yeah. What do you do, and you might as well count this one as your third baby, because that's what <laughs> mo- most folks do. Um, yeah, exactly. Is uh, how do you get away from it for a little bit? Like, like, what do you do to decompress, to unwind? What are yeah. what are things that, besides tennis? Don't use tennis. That's a cop out. No, yeah, that's I'm fair. <laughs> that's fair. Um, No, I was on a call earlier today and I was saying, honestly, I feel like having kids is like one of the best ways to have work-life balance because I'm forced to like, hey, we got to eat dinner. We got to do bed. Like I'm forced to put my phone down. I'm forced to put my laptop down. So that's huge. And for me, just really working to create that work-life balance and have downtime um, is important. So, you know, reading is a great escape. Running is a great escape. Um, just finding ways to be present, um, and, and try to put those boundaries with, cause there's always more work to do. Um, but if I'm going to do it well, I know that I need to have some rest and downtime. Absolutely. And for uh, those that want to connect with you yeah. when, you're, when you're not resting and it's not your downtime, <laughs> where, where where can people reach you? Yeah, so I'm always reachable by email. So it's just uh, my first name, Rebecca.Johnson at tmyl.org. Um, And you can find out more about us um, on our website at tmyl.org as well. Well, thank you for being on the program, Rebecca. I really appreciate the time and listening to your journey uh, as you develop a development organization. That's great. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thank you all again for taking some time out to listen to this program. Don't miss the next episode coming up in a couple of weeks. And if there's someone that you know of that you would like to hear about in their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on our YouTube channel or 
whatever fa- of your whatever of your favorite podcasting platforms that you like and give us a positive review. So thank you. And we'll see you next time in the control center. Thank you.